awesome introduction, and I thank you that you really prayed for me. <laughs> All right. So, um, so if I haven't met all of you yet, my name's Andrew Kennedy. Um, I'm originally from Yorkton, Saskatchewan. Um, if anybody knows who that is, that's awesome. If you don't, then that's awesome too. It's in Saskatchewan, so it's in the same ballpark. Um, so I grew up on a farm, um, with my mom and my dad and my brother Joey. Um, and I have other siblings too, but they're, we're long gone to college. I have a sister and two brothers and they're a lot older than I am. So the story that I'm gonna share with you is just with me, my parents and my brother Joey. So. Um, but first, before that, uh, has anybody ever done any renovating in, in your house? Yeah, I'm getting some hands. Yeah, so uh, this is going to go nicely. Um, so how I'm going to start this off is I, too, have had a lifelong renovating experience. And what I mean by that is, is my family was renting from, um, from some other landlord's farm, and then he decided that he wanted to live on his farm, so he told us to get out. Nicely, but he told us to get out. Um, so what we decided to do, well, what my mom decided to do, was she was going to go searching for some place for us to live because she and my dad were working a long while just to save up for their own place. So my mom, being the farm-driven woman that she is, decides we're going to live on a farm. So she looks and looks and looks, and nothing's just nothing suiting her at all and my dad doesn't care he just wants to live somewhere um happy wife happy life right um so my mom's going down this road one day she just decides to take a turn just because she can and she goes on this grid road and she sees this house out in the distance and it's a big brick house that's a big basically a big square block of a house and she says, God, I like that house. And she felt like God was saying, that's going to be your house. And she said, all right. And so she goes home and she tells my dad and then they go and look at the house. So they go and look at the house. This is a nice house. They walk inside the house. This is a pretty nice house. They start walking around. It has no plumbing. It turns out that this house is 150 years old and didn't even have plumbing yet. And what she just, she turns to my dad and she says, this is the house. And my dad's standing there going, okay. <laughs> so they buy the house and this house had really good bones, but it had rat's nests. It had, the whole thing need to, needed to be redone. The shingles needed to be redone. Everything needed to be redone. So first of all, my parents uh, get evicted, and then we have to live in a tent outside of this house before we start living in this house. And then my parents eventually figure out that that's not a good idea so they move us into trailers and then while we're living in these trailers they um, start renovating this house and it takes from um, when I was in grade 8 to right until I was in grade 11 there was one winter where we lived in one room 
in the house. And we still had no plumbing, and it was winter. And I'm like, what kind of child abuse is this? <laughs> I have to go outside just to go to the washroom. I have mad respect for people that actually, that was the way of life in those days. Um, so we renovate this house, and the house is good. We renovated it. It's um, my second year in high school, and we're doing good. The house isn't completely renovated yet. My parents have kind of gotten short in their budget and they've just been kind of picking away at their different projects that my mom had around the house and my dad, well, you always say, oh, I helped. But he, they would, uh, they, they were at a standstill. They were good, things were good. We could live in this house, it was livable. And then there was one night when we were coming home from um, a play that my foster brother, my foster brother um, came, to live with, came to live with us and he was doing a play and he done a really good job. And then my mom was celebrating with him with all of his, uh, all of his cast. But my dad, um, Joey and I decided to go home. So we, Driving, we're driving this little neon in the middle of winter, and it's a really, really bad storm outside. It's, it's getting pretty bad, so we get home, and we get into our, our house, and my dad turns on the light, but it doesn't come on. So he goes over to the fridge, and he is kind of in a huff because he's like, I want a nice warm home to come home to. So he opens this fridge, and I don't even know what he decided to feed us. I still, to this day, don't know what he fed us. It was some goo, and there was something in it. But I, I can't remember. But anyways, that's not important. Um, he says, all right, well, I'm going to call the electrician. So the He's on the phone with the electrician, and I'm just kind of moping around the house, you know, being cold. I haven't even taken my jacket off yet. And I hear this sound coming from the kitchen. And I'm, I'm standing there, and I'm like, are the cats jumping up on the table again? Because that's what it, it sounded like, because, you know, cats, they never get the message. Um, so I look in the kitchen just to see if I can catch these cats in the act, but there's nothing on kitchen counter but I still hear this sound it's the sound that sounds like cats jumping up on things and I'm like okay so I go back in the room and then I come back and then I notice that there is smoke coming from the front porch of our house because the porch was connected to the um, the kitchen and what happens is I kind of slowly go over to the door and I open it and the entire porch is on fire. And, you know, I should be freaking out right now, but <laughs> I didn't. I just kind of, oh, oh, <laughs> and then I'm like, the, the house is on fire. So I run over to my dad. He's still on the phone with the electrician and then... I said, Dad, the house is on fire. And he's like, I got to call you back. And then he clicks off the phone, and then <laughs> he never called him back. Um, and then we run over to the room, and then my dad is like, okay, we have to put this thing out. So we're trying to get every which where, trying to get water to this thing, but it was just not happening. So eventually my dad said, all right, we're getting out of here. So I'm standing in the kitchen, and my iPod is right over here, and my brother's right over here, and he says, Andrew, grab your brother. I grabbed my iPad, then I grabbed my brother, then I started heading out the exit. I've later repented for, for doing that. <laughs> so we run over to this uh, door that we've then winterized. The door's closed. It's shut, and we've boarded it up. It's the only entrance out of there that we can get out. So my dad and I, Joey, he has Down syndrome. He doesn't know what's going on. 
So we're ripping all of this stuff out of the door and ripping this door open. And then my dad, he's never boot kicked in his life, but in this moment, he boot kicks this door open and we get flying out of there. And I remember that I looked over the porch and we were on the front deck and the porch is starting to be slowly eaten up by this fire. So I me in my brain decides to uh, that I need to get Joey off of this uh, platform of wood as soon as possible so <laughs> I decide to throw Joey in the snow it was fine the snow was about that deep it was storing me outside God planned this so there's this, I throw Joey in the snow, and there's this little indent of where Joey used to be. So I jump in there after him, and we get in this little neon, and we drive away. And the last thing I remember is while we were driving away, I looked over across the road, and there was our house. It was half a block. It was like he chopped a block in half. And there was this ember silhouette of this once was brick building and one, I could see one window and there was just this ember thing in the distance. You could see it from the highway. We were without a home, a home that we built, rebuilt, re-renovated from the ground up. And it was a hard time. It was a time of hopelessness. And it was a time of saying, God, why? So in the Bible, there were many things that the Israelites were saying, God, why? It started with the line of David. David was the king of Israel. And for each line, his line of his children decided to get eviler and eviler and eviler. And then God said, enough is enough. So he sent the Babylonians in there to take them over. And then to make matters worse, later, then the Persians came in and take them over. And then the Greeks, Alexander the Great, went and took them over. And then the Romans came. That's a lot of stuff that can make you say, make those people of the day say, why? God, why? And in that time of um, being in the time of the Romans, they were still waiting on this coming Messiah. This one who is going to set everything right. The one who was going to bring something that wasn't there before. Now I'll get you to turn with your Bibles to, uh, if you have them, to John 2, verses 13. And I just want to... Just go into the story of when Jesus had come on this earth. He's already in his ministry, and he's coming to the temple for Passover. Now, when he comes, it was almost time of Jewish Passover. And he was in the temple courts, and he found people selling cattle, sheep, doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple. And he scattered the coins and those who sold doves. And he said, get these out of here. You're turning my father's house into a market. Now, I was just thinking, you know, how would that be today? So just imagine this. Imagine if some, uh, one day Kelly decides, Pastor Kelly, sorry, 
decides, I'm going to put a nice Starbucks right there in the corner. I'm going to put a nice Starbucks right there in the corner of my church, and when people come in, they can buy their Starbucks. But here's the thing. Starbucks comes in, and they get all the profits. And on top of that, when a speaker like me comes, they kind of hype up the price so that... Um, people are going to need their coffee because they want to get through what I have to say. <laughs> um, and it's not really said in the Bible, but it's implied that the leaders in that temple, they're not just letting them come in. They're making a little bit of a profit on the side. Because they're coming in, you use our space, you're renting our courts to bring your cattle and bring your stuff, we're going to have a little bit on the side too. So none of this is for God. And in that time, Jesus comes in and he says, stop turning my house of worship into a business. Who likes the Holy Spirit to be free? I like my coffee to be free, too. <laughs> um, and I'm glad churches serve free coffee. That's just one of the perks of being at church. Everybody knows that. And so Jesus comes in there, and the second part of this is the Jews then responded to him and said, what sign can you show us to prove your authority in all this? And Jesus answered him, and he says, I will destroy the temple, and I will raise it again in three days. And they replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he spoken of was his body, and he raised and after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the words Jesus had spoken. Now, when your house is falling apart, usually you're going to call this guy called an inspector. And he's going to come in and he's going to say, your house is falling apart, these things aren't what they should be, and it's just not good. Now, Jesus came in there, and he's like, I'm condemning this place. <laughs> this place is not functioning the way it's supposed to function, and I am going to tear it down in order to make something new come into its place. And we can see in John 10, the Pharisees take notice of this, and they're getting into a quarrel with Jesus again. And then Jesus says, okay, well, there's a bunch of sheep, see? And they're in this pen, see? And I'm the shepherd, okay? <laughs> And I'm the only one who can open that gate and let the sheep out. And they come to me because they hear my voice. And I'm going to lead them into new pastures. He goes in there and he says, in the middle, he says, I have come so they might have life. And have it in abundance. And he says that, you know, there's going to be people that come into the pen. You're not going to know who they are. They're thieves. And the hired help, which, you know, is supposed to be you, Mr. Pharisees. 
they're going to turn tail and run when a wolf comes. So I am the good shepherd. I'm the one who is leading this sheep. I am going to die for them and lead them into something new. So throughout his ministry, Jesus does this. He allows the high priests and all of his all of his officials, all the Pharisees, the Levites, all those holy people. He allows them to put him into prison, whip him, lead him up that nice steep hill with the cross and he dies that's a big house fire so when the house is burnt to the ground you don't need an inspector this time because if you do, he's going to stand there and he's going to kind of shift his feet a little bit and look at his clipboard uneasily and then he's going to turn to you and say, I don't know if you know this, but your house is gone. It's not there anymore. <laughs> it's burnt to the ground and in this moment he's going to refer you to a guy by the name of a contract. And the contract is going to come in and he's going to say, okay, here's what I'm going to do for you. Right now, we are going to take out all of the old ash and old soot and old stuff. Everything is gone. Jesus died on the cross. The old way has passed away. And I'm going to get you these guys called the apostles and they're going to help you root out the old stuff and make way for the new stuff. And the thing is, is that some foundational things in the Old Testament were passed away. A lot of things about the old law, like the ceremonial law, like sacrificing animals, was passed away now because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. So what happened now is that now that Jesus is wearing the hat of the contractor, he's rooting some stuff out and he is going to change some things. And he still is. Now, in my own life, there's a lot of places where God has tried to move me forward but I have always stood back. He said, Andrew, I want you to speak. And I'm like, no. I'm this timid little shy person and I'm not going to speak. God says, Andrew, I want you to write music. I said, no. <laughs> I want to keep my music to myself. Well, actually, I want to do stuff with it, but I'm too scared. And it's like, it's okay. I'm your contractor. I got this. In our lives, sometimes we're in the stages of replacing the foundation after something has been lost in our life. We know it's there, but it's lost. Sometimes we're in the stages of renovation, but we've stopped. It's not there anymore, and the excitement of finally getting that new kitchen or that bigger bathtub 
or that exciting new room in the house has just slowed down. And some of us are just ignoring that the house is burnt in the first place and, they, and just saying, I'll live in a tent. It's okay. I'll get to it later. God, I'll get to it later. I've been in all three places, and I've asked myself, God, what am I going to do? Could you imagine just renovating, and then you, you just tear out all the old stuff, and then you renovate, and then you just get there? It's been a long process, and then it's finished. And then you invite all of your friends over, and then they come into the door expecting something new, and then they look around and they say, it's exactly the same. Nothing has changed. Oh, look at that coffee ring mark that your coffee cup made like 10 years ago. You painted it on your countertop. <laughs> Usually when you're remodeling, you want to make something new. The function is the same, but there's some new components to it that makes the kitchen, that makes the bathroom more functional. And I feel like sometimes in my own life, God is calling me into somewhere that he has placed in my heart and he wants me to go to that area and just get better at it. Andrew, get better at music. Andrew, get better at speaking. Andrew, get better at rebuilding a house after I've burnt it to the ground. So, in case you haven't noticed, I got a hammer here. And the thing is, I've learned how to use this thing very well. Now, sometimes when we're moving into something new, we ask ourselves, am I really taking the right step here? Am I really going the right direction? And then we can go over to Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20, when Jesus is with his disciples and he's about to ascend to the sky, and he says these words, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. He doesn't give direct instructions right out, right there. He expects people to build on the foundation that he has left them to not turn away from the way that he has put in his word. But he has also made us to be creative and innovative. Because if we weren't, we'd still be using wooden mallets. I'd take this over a wooden mallet any day, and I'm sure a lot of you would, because a wooden mallet cannot get the thing out when you've messed up. And there's these... Uh, but it doesn't stop here. It doesn't stop at the new hammer. There are things we have called nail guns. 
I love nail guns. They get the job done very quickly, if you know how to use it. If you don't, then you're going to get something in somebody's foot and they're not going to be too happy with you. But the thing is, you have the hammer and it's always going to drive in something. It's always going to do its job the same way. A nail gun's going to do it the same way, but it's going to do it better. But they're both intended for the same thing. Sometimes when God leads us into new things, new areas in our lives, new mentorships, new skill sets, can be scary. But God says, I am your contractor. I am your inspector. I'm not going to let you down. And he didn't let us down by dying and not coming back. He is our hope. He did something that no other person has ever done. He cheated death. So what do we need to do when we don't know where the next step is? We need to go back to our wonderful counselor, the inspector of the spirit, the contractor of your faith, and the shepherd of your heart. We need to be willing to be like David when he wrote these words in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of all of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the, days in the, all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the end, there's going to be a house that's never going to have a fire. But we're here right now with our hammers. In the end, God's going to give us that nail gun. Even though the hammer is now, the nail gun is the future. Things are going to change. Someday, Jesus is going to come back. And it's pretty, it's going to be pretty bad. There's going to be some house fires in the end. But he's going to make all things new. And it's coming and it's real. So what's the next step? What's the house that is burnt in your life that God is pointing out? What is the renovations that need to take place that God is leading you into? And what is the goal, the house that God is promising you in the end? It's just the questions that I leave with you today. And I hope that when I come around Kindersley again, there's going to be new people, one for Christ, because of the people like you that God is using. So God, thank you. Thank you that you are doing a new thing in the land. 
And I pray that your Holy Spirit will just use this church in many miraculous ways so that they can build on the solid foundation of your word and walk into that new tomorrow, looking back and saying, wow, you did that. You are a good God. Thank you, Lord. Well, that's all I have to say. Thank you for letting me come speak with you guys today. It was fun. Thank you very much, Andrew, for, for that word. That was a good one.